Amen and amen. Well, we welcome all of you that are joining us here at uh, our Wednesday evening service at Redemption Church. And uh, we are very, very thankful that you've taken the time and uh, made yourself available to uh, hear something I believe good from the Lord. I believe God will bless you. And uh, we're looking forward to it. So again, we're glad you're here, aren't we? We are. And, you know, I believe that God is going to speak a word in due season to us tonight. And maybe you need to hear something from the Lord. So you open your heart, release your faith, and believe that He can speak something to you that will be that key that goes in the door, that opens up uh, the treasure house of God for you. Amen. All you need is one word from the Lord. That's Change right. your whole life. Just maybe one prayer, one word, and everything can shift. Uh, it, it, it turns on a dime, as the old saying goes, in the spirit. It really does. You all may be seated. Well, it's good to be in church. We're going to receive our regular Wednesday evening offering. And uh, we are very, very thankful for those of you out there that uh, support what we're doing. Uh, we know that God is our source. We, we acknowledge that. We don't ever forget that. But we also know that he moves on the hearts of people and instructs them on what to do and inspires them. And so it's a cooperation. It's God and you that make it happen. And so we're very thankful for that. We don't certainly take it for granted. We uh, are very, very, uh, we, we remind ourselves often that you don't have to. And we want you to know that we appreciate it. We really do. And we're thankful to the Lord for it. So we're going to worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings. There's a way on the screen there that uh, they can do that, isn't there? Mm -hmm. You can give um, online, of course. You can give through text. And then if you want to mail it in, you can do that too. You mean mail works today? Slowly, but it works. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Father, we just want to thank you for our time to be together. We thank you for the opportunity to uh, bring our tithes and offerings to you as worship. And we're very, very thankful that you are our source of supply. We don't take anything for granted in you. You are our need meter. You're the one. And we look to you and we worship you with our giving. And Father, we also take opportunity to pray over the word tonight as it goes forth. We just pray your blessing on it, your, your, your power and anointing. The Bible tells us that Jesus, when he preached, he, he, his word was with power. There is a power in the word. That's <laughs> the name of this program, the power of the word. So we believe there's power in the word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, are you ready? If you've got a Bible handy, get it, turn with us. We'll look at some important things, some good things. Now, last time we were together, we're obviously in the very early stages of a new year. And we talked about how people uh, coming into a new year, you find these little points of time in life where you come to certain uh, anniversaries or maybe uh, birthdays or various and sundry events and people make decisions. Well, from this day forward, I'm going to do this or I'm going to make a change here or a change there. And so New Year's is always one of those times where people make a lot of changes and they make a lot of resolutions. And the whole concept of a resolution, it comes from the word resolute. And, and the word resolute is, um, it, it actually is a solution. So a resolution is a, is a solution that you make. That's if you got a problem, whatever that is. Sometimes one of the big things that we want to do is get our diet a little bit under control. So we got this problem. We got to have a solution. We got to solve a problem. But the whole concept of resolve is at the core of making a resolution. And we found in Psalms uh, 112 in verse number seven, and it's talking about the man of God, the man that fears the Lord. You find that in verse one, but you come on down to verse number seven. And he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Now, to have a fixed heart is to have a, a heart that, that, is, that is concrete. It, it's resolute. It's fixed on a certain thing. It's not vacillating. It's not all over the place. But it's, it's, it has a, a certain 
focus. Paul said, this one thing I do. He didn't say this 101 things I do. He said, this one thing I do. You know, the scripture talks about a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. I was thinking today, and, and the scripture came to me, and actually, uh, I, I was going to pick up a little lunch, going through a little drive through and I was going to pick up a little lunch, and uh, I'm, I'm making a decision. I'm still parked. Car's still parked. I'm leaving one place, and I'm, I'm going to pick up a little lunch and take it home. And uh, I had two places in mind. You ever done that? You ever have two things you're thinking about? Well, I don't know whether I'll go here. I don't know whether I'll go there. And it's going to determine when I leave the parking lot which way I go. Will it be east or west? You know, that's, it's that, that exact. And before I left the parking space, I said, no, nope, I know exactly where I'm going. No second guessing, no question, and I'm going there. Now, it's funny how a decision can change a lot of things. Now, that's a re really minor decision, except unless you're real hungry. It's not so minor, huh? But the point is, when you're double-minded, in other words, you, you can't, well, I don't know if I want to go here, or I don't know if I want to go there. The scripture says, a double-minded man is unstable in his, all of his ways. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. Now, I'm giving you a very, very simple concept about something that is much, 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 much more important than that. And sometimes people do not make a resolute decision about things that are very important about life. They, they have the idea that life is going to come to them. Well, if I just, uh, you know, if I just uh, float on through, uh, it'll, it'll happen. What will be, will be. Well, life won't treat you that way. If you're going to get a, if you're going to get a word from God, if you're going to get a, a help from God, if you're going to get an answer from God, an answer to prayer, you got to make a decision. Because a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways, and that man will not receive anything from the Lord. You say, well, what if I make the wrong decision? Well, I can tell you this: to make no decision is absolutely the wrong decision. You have to decide. Will I follow this career path? Will I follow that career path? You've got to decide one or the other. You say, well, they both look appealing, or they maybe, uh, maybe if, if I did this, I'd miss out over here. Well, you don't know those things. You don't know the future. But God's not going to get involved in, you with, in this thing with you until you make a decision. You have to decide. You have to choose. We have to choo choose this day whom you will serve. You have to choose. And so we can't have a fixed heart unless we have a resolute nature about us. We have to make a decision. We have to, we have to do it. So a resolution is based on that, on that concept. And I've made a lot of decisions that were really weak. And you probably have too. But, but decisions have um, weight. You know, small decisions, small things, they're not as important. So you don't have to be nearly as, as precise or nearly as exact, because if you miss it, it's not a, not a huge deal. But big decisions uh, require big guidance. The more serious something is, the more you need to be sure that it's the way you should go. And you can't ever, you can't ever be 100%. Uh, we don't, you don't know the future. You, you, you may have as much certainty at the moment in time you're at, as you could possibly have, but you just don't know the future. And because you don't know the future, you think, well, maybe I'll miss it. Well, what happens with us is we begin to, to vacillate and then it turns into fear. And we begin to be fearful about making any decision. And you see people, they become reclusive in life. They, they have a difficult time meeting the challenges of life because they can't make the necessary decisions to move forward. And you see a lot of people like that. Well, God doesn't want us to live that way. We need to make decisions. We need to, we need to have follow through when we make them because if we don't, the, the answers won't come. What, what will happen is you'll not see God intervene until you make some decisions. You have to make some choices. 
And so that's what these things that we talk about making these New Year's resolutions are all about. You have to resolve. You have to do some things. We talked about a couple last week, and we'll just refresh ourselves with them and then move forward. But first, we need to make a, a fresh commitment to God's Word. Now, that that's critical. Uh, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. You have to... Um, make some concrete decisions about being a person of the word. And there are things, and we talked about it last week, we talked about the fresh start to reading the scripture through for the year. And uh, we don't, I don't have those Bible uh, uh, reading guides right in front of us, but if you need one, you can let us know, we'll send it to you. Uh, it won't cost you anything. Just get it in your hand so it'll help you. But there are other ways you can do it. But you need to have a plan. And it, because if you don't have a plan, you probably won't move forward. Uh, a plan will it'll put, a little, it'll put a little tension on you. And sometimes I need a little tension on me. I was talking to some people. They're finishing up last year with their Bible reading. And, and they were talking about having to hurry. They're, they're, you know, a lot of them were in the book of Revelation, you know, the last book of the Bible. And they're finishing up the year. And they're having to read a little more because they got to get through. And uh, I talked to a number of people that, that were having that challenge. But that's good, you know, because we put a little tension on ourselves. We put a little, little, you know, something that tugs us along a little bit. And so we don't set goals for the purpose of just uh, frustrating ourselves. We set goals so we accomplish things. Goals are in tune with th these things that we're talking about. So a lot of a lot of times a resolution will have a goal attached to it. So we need to be people of the word. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our life completely changed when we got in the word. Absolutely. Yeah, completely changed. You know, I want to say this at this point in time. You know, you come to the end of one year right. and you're going into a new year. And so you can be dealing with things and maybe you've been dealing with them for an ongoing period of time. It could be longer than a year. Right. It could be. Right. And I think there has to be a time in your life where you say, okay, this is enough. It's enough already. I don't want to deal with this any longer. God has made provision and he has made a way. And um, I, I'm reminded of that story uh, of the lepers in Second Kings. I think it's yeah. chapter number seven. And they're sitting there, and they're going to die. They're going to starve. They're sick, and they're just going to die. But one says, you know, why do we sit here till we die? And that's yeah. kind of the way that we can be. We can face issues in life, and we can face a problem, a difficulty, troubles that are going on, and and just sit there in it. Or you can be like uh, like they were. Why sit? With, why are we going to do this? Right. We don't have to do it. There's provision on the other side. Right. Well, with God, there's provision. Right. There's a way of escape. There's a way to get out of what we're looking at. And so a new year gives you a new opportunity to say, draw that line. I've had enough. This is enough. Right. No more. I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm standing upon His promises. And it's a foundation that will hold me and take me where I need to be. You know, back when I was... Um you know, doing some things in, in, in school. Uh, I'm reminded of some things that I studied in, in psychology. And one of the things that they talk about where people are, are really low achievers in life. And one of the things that makes a person a low achiever is, is this thing called muddling through. Just people just muddle through life. They, they don't, they don't have direction. They just yeah, you know, well, I'll, I'll do this and I'll, I'll do that. I'll, I'll do this job over here and do that job over here. I, I know that uh, when uh, we we hadn't been married very long, and I had I had gotten out of the army, and we got married, and you're going through, you know, you're finding your way, and you're young. I was 20 when I got out of the service, so we're just kids, and. Uh, you get all these junk jobs. You ever, you ever had a junk job? 
I mean, it, it, it's like, I can't even believe I did some of that stuff. But you know, you gotta, you gotta get going. And, uh, oh, I guess it took a couple of years before we got jobs that meant anything, that were <laughs> worth anything. And, and I had some, what others considered to be pretty good jobs. They were kind of hard jobs to get. And so you have a friend that has a friend and you get a, a good job, but it wasn't suited for me. It just was not suited for me. And then you finally begin to get some focus. And you get that, you know, that job that, you know, could be, could turn into a lifetime job, a career path and, and stuff. Well, it changes things. It, it really begins to change things. And those other, you know, I'll do this for a month. I'll do this for six months. Wait, I'll do this till I can get something better. Well, see, you, you don't have real good direction in life. Uh, you just, you just, you don't need a job. You need a career path. You, that's what you need. The jobs are secondary because once you have, once you know what you want to do, the job becomes a part of that process. But just to, well, I can get this job. Somebody's hiring over here. Somebody's hiring over there. I'll go do that a while. I'll go do that, do that a while. You got to decide what you want to do with life. What do you want to do with your life? Do you want to live your whole life doing something you don't want to do? You know, about 80%, they tell us, of people do mm -hmm. live their life doing things they don't want to do and are not suited to do, but they do it. See, God, when he comes to you and he manifests himself to you, he has a plan for you. He has a distinct plan. Now, you may not understand that plan, and it may take some unfolding to get that thing unwrapped because you may not recognize it in the beginning. Because I, I can look back in my early life and, you know, I've always, uh, my aptitudes, I just tests and things of that nature. I'm, I'm a total, totally mechanical. That's me. Engineer, my, all my guidance counselors said, you need to go an engineer path. That's what you need to do. And I always like messing with old cars and things like that and, you know, make them go faster stuff. Well, that's true. Uh, but I didn't work at that. That just that just came. So for me to to have a a path of my life the way I do, where I speak publicly, lead people, all that, that wouldn't have entered in my life at all. I wouldn't have thought that in a million years. So sometimes your aptitudes and the things that you think you might want, it, God may have another plan altogether, and you have to discover that. See, I didn't think I would be suited for it. And now I'm totally suited for it. I can't imagine doing anything else. Now I still enjoy the other. And I'm still mechanical by nature and aptitudes. I'm still that way. But that's not my pursuit. Had I pursued that, that would have been totally out of the plan of God. And so you have to discover what, you, what you've got. And then you begin to pursue it. And then you begin to focus on it. And it will determine what you read. It'll determine who you associate with. It'll determine your jobs that you do take because some of your jobs may be contributors to a bigger step that you need to take. You know, you got to, if you're going to be uh, uh, in a skilled profession, you're probably going to have to do some apprenticeship or some things like that because you won't know how to do it initially. If you're going to be, a, a, if you're going to fly jumbo jets, you're going to learn how to fly a Piper Cub first. You're not just going to get in the, in, in the cockpit of a jumbo jet. That's not going to happen. So there's a lot of steps along the way. So your career paths will, will be, be taking you to where you need to go. You, if you want to be a doctor, don't study law. I mean, it seems pretty basic, but it's the truth. See, so people spend time doing things that are not contributing at all to where they're headed. And so uh, you, can, you can go through life spending a lot of time on the wrong things. And when you come up to a year change, a birthday, an event, an anniversary, or something that marks you a little bit, yes. it's good to make a new decision. And that's what we're talking about. And so, of course, we talked about the first one being uh, making a, a decision to 
to be a student, at least a reader of God's word, reading and studying are different, but you read before you study. A lot of times I know uh, for me, I have to study to do what I do. Uh, you have to study the Bible to, you know, build sermons and, and preach and have content. But there's times that I don't want to study. I just want to read for me. Now, if you learn how to read for you, it seems like the study comes a lot easier, you know, and sometimes you can go to the Bible to find a word for somebody else. You know, you can find those, I got you scriptures, <laughs> you know, things of that nature. Sometimes we want to tell people how they ought to do instead of sitting at the foot of the cross and let God tell us what to do. <laughs> and that's what reading the Bible will do. It's a, um, boy, you need to make some changes here. But when it's just you and God, I mean, it's not threatening. It's, 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 you know, you don't want to be preached to, you know what I'm talking about? You don't want somebody coming up telling you, now you ought to do this. You should do that. Nobody likes that much. I mean, you know, of course that's my job a little bit to do that, but, but no, people, people resent that. But when God starts talking to you, um, it's different now and it's just you and him. And that's when your life begins to take on a different shape. And that's what the psalmist said, Psalms 119. He said, uh, he said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so when we go to God, just read the word, we find how to make the adjustments and the cor corrections for life so we live a better life. We just live a better life. People who read the Bible live a better life. I guarantee you live a more peaceful life. Uh, I guarantee you that. And then, of course, the second resolution that we talked about was making a, a, a fresh commitment to prayer because prayer is such an important part, vital part of the Christian's uh, being. Just everything about you, spending time with God is really everything. And they kind of go together because you, when, you, when you pray, you read, and when you read, you pray. And I'll find myself just reading along in Scripture and praying as I go. Because I'll see something in there and say, Lord, you know, help me, help me do that. You, you, you read things about other um, people in the Bible. You, you read about a man like Enoch who walked with God. As scripture says, he walked with God and he was not. God took him. It just God took him. He didn't die. He just, God just took him. I heard one fellow talking about it. He said, he said uh, that Enoch and God got so close that... Um, they were walking along one day and uh, Enoch said, well, why don't you come over to my house? And he said, no, we're closer to mine. You just come on home with me. Hmm. So you read along like that and you see here somebody that was so close to God. Well, if that doesn't put a desire in you, then hmm, I don't know what, I don't know what else would. So you read things and then you begin to pray and you, and you begin to talk to God. Well, you know, I don't know that I'll have an Enix experience. I think that's probably unique and I probably never would. And not that I necessarily would want to, but I would like to know you in the way he knew you. I'd like to understand you that way. Paul prayed. He said, oh, that I might know you in the power of your resurrection. I'll read along in scripture. I'll see something like that. I'll pray it. I, I want that. I, I want that, you know? And so the whole, the whole exposure to the word is, is a motivation for the whole prayer process. So they go hand in glove, they go right together. And that's, I think walking with God, walking in harmony with God and God talking to you through that book. And you know, that whole process there is prayer. See, prayer is communication with God. It's not just going in there with your list of stuff you want. Prayer is communication with God. So when you, when you have that input from him and you give him your input back and it goes back and forth and there's an exchange like that, 
as far as your Christian walk goes, guys, that's it. If you want to know what successful Christianity is, that's it right there. God talking to you, you talking to him, and you walking in harmony together. That's successful Christianity. And you know, Eddie, um, the scripture says, pour out your heart to the Lord, right. all you people. And there is something in that that I don't think, I think we just read that. I, I'm speaking for myself, read it and pass over it. But we don't need to pass over it. Right. There is something about when you can come to the Lord and pour out your heart. Recently, I had a, um, a situation that, that I was looking at and I knew it wasn't time to talk to people. Right. I knew I didn't need to talk to people about it. You know, sometimes you want to hear right. others' opinions, counsel, you know, and that, that's scriptural too. But I knew I wasn't to do this right. in this situation. And so I just went to the Lord and poured that out before right. Him. And it was amazing how that I felt and sensed the presence of the right. Holy Spirit to give me the assistance and uh, really, I guess, some healing over right. that, right. you know, to bring that into my life. So I think that there's a part of the prayer life that God wants us to come to Him and talk to Him, talk over things with Him, allow Him to give you His counsel mm -hmm. on certain things. And I, I tell you, I believe that the body of Christ, if we would do that, that we would be healthier mentally, even physically, because, you know, that. a lot of things eat at us yeah, and wear away that. and make us sick physically. And so I think mm. we could be healthier uh, mentally and emotionally right. if we would do that. And I've, I've watched in my own life, if I hold things in and I bottle it up, so to speak, and don't pour out my heart to the Lord, there is a definite difference in my condition. Well, you know, I think, I think as you, as you talk about that, and that's absolutely the truth. I think a lot of people are afraid to pour out their heart before the Lord. Cause I, th I think that we have this idea that if we get honest with God, he's going to be surprised. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's not, he knows it already. He's just waiting for you to, I'm not talking about confession of sin. It may be, but I'm talking about getting honest with your own feelings. See, and, and, and you know, I'm a, I'm a faith guy, and I believe you can have what you say, and I believe your, your words are important. And I think that sometimes, however, we can take that truth to where it becomes not a truth, but it becomes a problem. I'm afraid to say what's really on my heart to God. And you need to. There's times I just don't want to obey God. What? No, I don't. And usually it's related to you. He asked me to do things that affect your life that I sometimes don't want to do. Can you imagine that? See, that's the calling of God on your life, that he wants you to do things for the benefit of others that are going to be work for you. They're, 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 you're going to have to do, do things that you sometimes don't want to do. But to obey God, the Bible says the love of Christ constraineth me. There's something that, that pulls you along and it's your love for the Lord. Sometimes it's not your love for people. There's things that I don't, I don't love people enough to do that, but I love God enough to do it for the people. And you need to get honest about that. You know, I'm at a stage in my life, I mean, I'm, I could retire if, if I chose to. I mean, a lot of people my age have and do. I can't find a retirement plan in, for what I do in the scripture. I haven't found those verses. I've looked, believe me. But the point is not so much that you're hunting a way to get out of doing something. It's just you do something a long, long time and you want variety. Everybody wants variety in life. They want a, a freshness and a newness about life. And so you talk to God honestly. And I think he wants honesty from you. See, and I don't think it's going to bother him. And I don't think you're going to mess things up if you do talk about it honestly. Because all he wants to do is answer you. 
And the reason we don't get answers is because we don't, don't ask him the, the, the real deal. We're, we're, we're afraid that we skirt the issue. We, do, we run around, run around, run around, run around, and we won't get right down to the heart of the matter. Until you get to the heart of the matter, you're not going to find out. And we need to. Now, I'm not talking about complaining. That's a, complaining's a sin. You've you got to watch that part. But you can go before the Lord and be honest. Lord, I tell you what, I, I'm not sure I really want to do this. I had God ask me, he said, what are you going to do about that thing I asked you to do? I said, I wouldn't plan on doing anything. I wouldn't plan on doing anything. I'm just going to leave it alone. You know, but, but he'll nudge you. There's things he asked me to do years ago that I never got around to. And then it, sometimes he just brings it back. Sometimes it'll go away, but sometimes he'll bring it back. What are you going to do about that? You... You build a lot of buildings and stuff for the Lord. And there, there's, there's got to be a long-term plan. You've you got to be moving, 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 moving. And it's like, oh, no. We've got to do another one? And you just don't want to because it's expensive. Well, what are you going to do about that? Well, I wasn't planning on doing anything about it. I said, well, you're going to have to. He'll leave you alone for a little while, but he'll come back. He'll come back. I promise you he will. So we're talking about these resolutions and things that go on. Now, this, this other one here, this one, may, we may meddle on this one. You want to be meddled with? You want to be picked on a little bit? What? Picked on? Well, I won't pick on you on purpose, but God may pick on you a little bit by his spirit. But we need to make a fresh commitment to church attendance. Now I know that we're talking online now and, and for the last couple of years we've had to do a lot of things in ways that we had fortunately for us here when all this stuff happened we already had cameras lights a lot of the things that we have to have and some churches didn't have it and they had to scramble to get in the game now, we had to do a lot of changing. We had to do some things with, uh, you know, our, our Internet speeds and stuff like that, fiber optics and cables, and they had to all be run. And, you know, stuff, it, you know, it's a lot of work and a lot of money to get it so that we can do it. But we weren't starting from scratch. We, we knew enough to be able to step into that arena. And there, I'm sure that there are some things that we're still stepping into that we've not accomplished at all yet. But at least we weren't starting from nothing. And some of these churches that had to start from nothing, sorry, guys, if they couldn't transition, a lot of those churches don't exist today. Over 4,000, we talked about this last week, I believe, but over 4,000 have closed in the last year. Well, I don't know what all the reasons for that are. Uh, I, I, and I couldn't even venture a guess. But the dynamics in the body of Christ are different. And so we've had to evaluate so many things. How do you do youth? How do you do children's ministry? How do you do, how do you meet when <laughs> everybody's locked up? How do you just even have little meetings, little leadership meetings, little prayer meetings, the things that you do in the body life of a church? How do you do that? So a lot of that stuff has gone to Zoom calls. It's gone to, you know, things you do over the internet. And, and thank God we can do that. People have been working from home and they've had to, had to go through the technology challenges of, of figuring out how to work from home. Well, all that's real stuff. And that's where society is right now. And some are more, I'm not, I don't, I'm not real super tech savvy. I get by, but uh, that's, you know, I write out my sermons. That tells you a lot right there. So uh, anyway, saying that to say that, that, if we don't try to do it in a way where we can reach people, you just lose everything. So we've been forced through this. We've been drugged through a keyhole, what it boils down to. We've been forced to do things we didn't want to do. Okay, so we've, we've got this new life now that we're living. We, 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 okay, well, now we can do that. But what happens is some of the basic stuff that's very, very important to our Christian um, life get left behind. And so we need to make a fresh new commitment 
to the house of the Lord, to church attendance. Because we can, we can believe that church attendance is no longer important because we've got all of these other things. Now I know that I'm speaking to lots of people online. I know that. We get those numbers. I see them. I know. There are thousands of people that listen to this. And we're thankful for that. Okay? But it's not a substitute for going to church. And it never can be. And so what we have to do is back up and back away and remind ourselves, look, we're thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful that we can do this for this season of time. But we can't allow ourselves to get complacent and believe it's the be all end all. It's not the answer. God still never changed when he said, forsake not the assembling of yourself together. It, it, that's never changed. And so we have to have church in our life. That's really true. You know, the Bible says that iron sharpens iron. Yeah. When you get with other believers, there is a tangible presence of God that can be imparted, yeah. anointings that can go forth. And I'm not going to say that the anointing can't right. be imparted online because well, I believe that it, it can, mm -hmm. but there, there's nothing that's right. going to take the place in being in fellowship with a group of people that love the Lord, that are hungry for the Lord. I tell you what can happen uh, is you can, um, you can start going backwards. You can start losing your um, uh, love. Mm -hmm. You can start losing your fervency for the Lord and spiritual things. But if you stay close in that body, then it will provoke you. Well, that's what the scripture says. It, it, uh, that's what Hebrews ten twenty four said. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. And yes. then he, he said, and that's in connection with not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So the provocation comes from association. We get together and we provoke one another. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. And provoke unto good works. Provoke to do the right thing, right decisions. And exhorting one another. And he said, so much the more as you see that day approaching. And so we know Jesus is coming soon. And he said, the closer we get to that, it's more important to put that as a priority than to let it slip from us. Now, I've got this little uh, thing. I ran this off. It, it's interesting to me. But these are reasons why uh, people go to church. These are just answers that people gave. They, they were asked, why, why do you go to church? And one, it says, to, to become closer to God. That's pretty good. You know, want to get closer to God. Another said, so their children will have a moral foundation. Mm. Now, see, that's really important right there. It sure because is. Because you, you can... Uh, you can do good things for your children at home, but the societal development, the social development that a child needs, they're not going to get that at home. Totally. They'll get a lot of it at home, but you have to get out and get around other people. Uh, I was, uh, we had some consultants that, that we used a number of years ago for some things we were doing here in the church. And one of the things that's always, it's always stuck out to me, but they were talking about preachers, ministers, lead pastors, senior pastors, and they were talking about what caused failure in many of these men or women. And uh, one of the things, and, and they said that this was at the top of their list, what caused a person to have a failure. And the number one thing that they said is because they began, now listen, to work alone. Don't have anybody else in their life. Now, a lot of what you do in the ministry is alone. You study alone, you prepare alone, you do a lot of things by yourself. But if you close your, your life out to others, if you don't allow other people in, if you don't associate, talk, fellowship, go to coffee with, go to lunch with, do certain things, if you don't do that, you, it's a recipe for disaster. Mm -hmm. It's just a risk. And, and these are people that consult nationwide and they, they know the lay of the land and they will tell you when, when men and women of God begin to work alone, there's things that will happen that will sabotage their ministry. 
And I don't think that's just for preachers, guys. Now, we're talking about making some resolutions about church attendance. You will find yourself willing to accept and embrace things that you would have never been willing to accept and embrace when your fellowship was right with God and when you were around church. You'll just begin to accept it and embrace it. as It's okay now. But it used to not be okay. Why is it all of a sudden now okay? It's not, any, it's not any more okay now than it was. See, it's not that the events changed. It's you changed. And your outlooks change. And we have to be real careful. And there needs to be somebody that steps into your life and says, no, wait a minute. I don't think you ought to be thinking like that. Well, I don't want to hear that. I know you don't want to hear it. That's why you need to hear it. And your sister sandpaper is going to rub you wrong. I guarantee you that. But you need her in your life as much as you don't want to hear what she's got to say. And I'm not talking about people haranguing you for being who you are, but I'm talking about people who care enough about you to say, well, mm, maybe you don't need to do that. You maybe need to rethink that. Because we need the body. We provoke to good works. Mm -hmm. That's what the scripture says. And so uh, this, I think this part here about giving their children a moral foundation is huge. I think it's huge in our day, you know, yeah. where in, when the educational process cannot be education anymore. It's not about right. reading, writing, and <laughs> yeah. arithmetic yeah. as we used to hear. It, mm. That's not what it's about anymore. It is an agenda. It is an indoctrination right. that can be there. And so there's got to be something that counters. And I know uh, here and pastoring in the church, I get really concerned sometimes about our children um, and parents and and maybe they need to focus in more on that moral foundation because if you think they're going to get it at school, they're not going they're to get, not it, gonna at get it at school. There. You have to give it at home, yeah. and then your church needs to be able to reinforce that and teach and train right. the children. If not, what is the next generation going mm. to be? If we do, Good you know, I, I know, and I've thought about this a lot, and it's like, what, you know, when uh, the ministers that are on the scene right now that are good, solid, on the word ministers, what is going to happen when they're off the scene and what is, what's going to step forth? You well, you know, know, you know, along that line right now, they, they tell us this is a statistic I read recently. Only about 30 percent, a little less than a third of ministers, preachers, pastors, even believe in the rapture. Now, guys, if you're a literal Bible believer, you believe the Bible literally, you can't believe anything but the catching away of the church. If you don't believe in the rapture, you don't even know the Bible. Now, you may have, you may have a difference of opinion when and where, but the fact that you don't believe there's going to be one, that's pretty fundamental to your faith. And you got 30% of the guys leading flocks believe it. Two thirds don't believe it. I'm sorry. Because anything you see coming from the pulpit is going to happen in the congregation times 10. Multiplied, yes. And I'm sorry. And we, we stay with the book. That's just it. We're not doing anything else. We're staying with the book. And, and I don't know everything. But I'm not preaching stuff I don't know. We're staying with the book. And that's the only thing that's going to give you any stability. But see, that's what happens in church. Because if, 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 the, if the preachers can drift that far, what do we think, my goodness, that people out here living, you know, with a lot of world on them, what do we think they're going to do? I mean, you just make it up as you go. There's no direction for life. And that's why you need church. Now, again, church doesn't make you a Christian. Going to church will not make you a Christian. So that old saying goes, you, you know, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than being in a, uh, in a garage makes you a car, you know, and everybody laughs. But it's true. 
Because you're not a Christian because you go to church. But I'll tell you this. If you're a successful Christian, you go to church. <laughs> if you're an obedient Christian, you go to church. Ouch, but true. Amen. So again, you know, I know we're coming online and all that, and we're talking to everywhere all over. And so we're thankful for that, but it's not a substitute. It's just not a substitute for the local church. And another reason that people go to church, they find comfort in times of trouble or sorrow. Mm -hmm. You do. So important. You, you really do. I mean, at the, at the tough times in life, the body of Christ uh, will rally around you. They should. The Bible says we comfort with the same comfort that we're comforted with. And um, I, I think that when we have gone through troubles, and we all have, it becomes a tool of ministry for somebody else. If you've lost somebody in, in life, you know, through, through death or whatever, you really do have an empathy for somebody that's facing the same things you face. And you have a, you have a, there's a, there's a bond and a closeness that nothing else will, will give. It's hard to have empathy if you've never been there. But when you have, we comfort with the same comfort mm -hmm. we've been comforted yes. with. Yes. So our tough times become a tool of ministry to help. Well, if you're alone, you don't have it. And you need it. We need it. And that's why we need, uh, one of the reasons why we need the church. And, you know, if you're in a local church, you need to get involved. Yeah. You know, you need to serve. You need to get in a small group, do something so people know you and you can pray for them. They can pray for you. That's very important. I know sometimes um, some people can have a tendency to slip in, slip out, you know, kind of thing. So. Well, you know, we, we find another reason that people go to church is they find serm the sermons valuable. Well, of course they do. You were supposed to laugh right there. You didn't, you didn't catch the cue. But it's okay. I guess it was my timing. But anyway, another reason that people go to church is they want to be a part of a faith community. Now, that word community is a really important word. You know, periodically, Jesus said, when, when they were in the upper room and he's getting ready to go through all the things that led to Calvary and ultimately crucifixion and then resurrection, but they're in that upper room and he's sharing with them what we would call a communion meal. And they're going through that process and he's making covenant with his disciples. And that's what he did with you when you came to him, when you were born again. He made communion with you. Now, the word communion, when we talk about receiving the Lord's table or the Lord's supper, it's the combination of two words. It's common, union, communion. That's what we do. Common meaning that we share this together. This is a common thing that we have together. It's common to us. We're in, we're in harmony about it. It's a common thing. A union is more directed to, to purpose or cause. We're united because we have a purpose. We serve the Lord. We, 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 we're people of the book. There, there are things that we have in common that unite us. Common union. Now, when you talk about out here and people use the word community and they throw it around, well, you know, there's the, there's the Rocky Hill community. There's the, there's the, 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 the Gibbs community, you know, there's the, the, the Halls community. Well, that's okay. I mean, I get it. I mean, but that's more based on region than it is based on heart. Nothing wrong with that, but the communion that God's talking about or the community that God's talking about is a faith based proposition. It's not based on location. It's based on something much, much, much deeper than that. You should not pick your church because it's close to your house. You should pick your church because it's close to your heart. 
You know, I drive past 20 to get to the one that God put me in. You know, well, I'm going to this one because it's close to the house. Well, that's the wrong reason. Now, you may be fortunate enough where they're both close to your heart and close to the house, too. That's okay. But I drive from here to Timbuktu and back to go to the church that God told me to go to. The Bible says God sets the solitary in families. He puts you, he unites you with the family. And if you're in a church where you're not united with the family, that's not his church for you. That may be where you go and you can go there and get blessed and listen to sermons and sing the songs. And that's okay. But there's a place that you, you don't need to join a church. You need to belong to a group or a family. And joining and belonging are different. You know? And so when God unites you, I mean, he's united. Now, that whole concept of community, that's a sacred proposition, guys. When we receive the Lord's table and we receive communion and, you know, we, we, we take the, the, the wine, the blood, we take the, the broken body and we eat. Uh, and we, we just do in remembrance of me and we, we acknowledge what Jesus did and on and on and on. But, but in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it tells you very clearly, you're not just making this communion with him and God. You're making this communion with one another. And he put it right down here where we live. So when we receive communion, we're not just doing it directly to God. Now we are, but that's not all we're doing. We're uniting and locking arms with our brothers and sisters. That's why you better not betray them. Because one minute you, you're, you're coveting with them and the next minute you're talking about them. You better watch that thing. So you're in conflict with yourself. Don't do that. Don't touch Christ's body. Don't touch it. You, if you do, you're most unwise. Maybe you don't know, but maybe you need to know. Because we just kind of, oh, yeah, it don't make any difference. I can say or do anything I want to say or do. No, you can't. Not live long and healthy, you can't. This one will cost you. This is the most sacred thing you have to deal with on this earth. And when we count it a common thing and put it underfoot, my goodness, what does it say about us? I don't want it said about me. I don't. It's holy. It's sacred. And it needs to be remembered and looked at that way. These are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And when we use the word brother and sister, we mean it. That's not just a Christian phrase. That's a Christian truism right there. And you know what? That's exactly how God intends it. I mean, the Bible talks about, you know, calling them brothers and sisters. That's what he said. And it's sacred, you know. And now I've got an earthly family. They're all in heaven now but me. But I've got a spiritual family that's much, much bigger. And, you know, it's just as real, though. Different, but real. And, you know, this is the bunch that I'm going to spend eternity with, with some additions. But, I mean, I, <laughs> I look forward to it. You know, can you imagine Starbucks in heaven? I mean, I bet it's nice, don't you? Can you imagine that coffee maker? Do they make them out of gold? I don't know. But you know, when we fellowship, it's, it's sweet, guys. And it needs to be remembered to be that. And so this whole thing about a faith community is important. And you know, that uh, another reason people go to church is they want to, uh, continue their family's religious traditions. I don't know if that's really good, but, but I did come up in church. I grew up, you know, somebody, I heard somebody say that, you know, that when they were little, they had a drug problem and they, they got drugged to church every week. You know, uh, I kind of had remembrances of, of that, but uh, I'm thankful for it. And so 
sometimes tradition and that it's not really good. But I'm glad for the godly traditions. We went to church. And I would feel really awkward not going to church now. Because it's just me. That's, that's in my DNA, you know. It's in the inner man. Amen. And we're better people because of it. We are better people yeah, because of are. it. So there's so many good things that happen to us when mm -hmm. we're a, a <clears throat> part of a church. Now, we could go on and on and on here. But we've talked about three important things. One, having a, a, a commitment to the word, having a commitment to prayer, and having a commitment to the church. Now, the fourth resolution was be committed to love. We're not going to touch that tonight. We, we wouldn't have time, and, and, that, and that's good because we want to leave it kind of right here. But I want you to be stirred inside yourself about making these New Year's resolutions. Get resolute. Have the fixed heart. Do it. If you've been waiting, don't wait anymore. Make the commitments and then have the follow through. Very, very important for you. And, and God will bless you in the process. Amen. Yes. And remember, you can make a decision and you can change your direction and chart your course to go a different way and make sure it's God's way. But you know, if all these things we talk about, they're, they're, they're not nearly as important is making a decision to receive Jesus Christ. If you've never been born again, all this other stuff is just, it's in vain. You can be real close to religious activities and not know the reason it happens. So we need to be born again. We need to come by faith to God. If you believe that Jesus Christ is um, the one that bore your sin. He hung on Calvary's cross. He went to the cross for your sin. He died for it, for, for your sin. He was resurrected. He lives now forever. If you believe those things, you believe all the right things. You just have to make a commitment to give your life to it. That's what you have to do. It's not enough just to believe it. You have to commit to it. Pray this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, do it right now. Do it. You hear me? Do it. Come while you can. Do it now. Say, Jesus, Jesus. I take you right now as my Lord and my Savior. I give my life to you to serve you today and forever. Sin, Satan, I don't serve you. Jesus, you are my Lord. Now, if you prayed that prayer, I know you meant it. You wouldn't pray it. Simple prayer, short prayer, doesn't take a long time to pray it, but it changes everything. Everything. Because you know what happens when you do that? He moves into your life. He literally comes in. The Bible says that when we're born again, we receive the Spirit of God. You say, well, I, I, I don't know if I can live that. Well, you can't. I can tell you that. But with His help, you can. And when He moves in, he changes you. He changes you from the inside out, not from the outside in. Religion tries to change you from the outside in. God changes you from the inside out. It's a heart proposition. So if you prayed that prayer again, I know you meant it. Let us know. There's a way you can do that on the screen. We want to know because we want to pray with you. You're our brother and sister in Christ, and we care about you. We really do. And we've enjoyed being with uh, our friends tonight, haven't we? Exactly. It's always so good to have you with us. Let us hear from you. Let us know what's going on in your life, good things that God's doing, or maybe you have a prayer request. We'll be glad to pray with you about that. Let's, uh, let's pray for our friends. We're going to pray for God to heal you if you need it. God to bless you. God take any sorrow away from you if there's something going on there. But we're just going to speak blessing over you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for our friends here in the room, but also all across this country and even around the world. We pray that you touch them right there where they're at. If they need healing in their body, we speak that right now mm -hmm. over them. If they need to have some uh, sorrow or grief, I, I sense those words right now. Uh, if they need to have that broken off their life, we break it, break the power of it in Jesus name. And Lord, we just speak your blessing over them. And we, we just not right now project our love and our faith to them 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Amen. Thanks for being a part. We're glad you're here. We'll be here Sunday morning uh, at 1030. So make a special point to be with us for that. And also again next week, we'll be right back here. Same as the old Batman thing, same bat time, same bat channel. We'll be back, but it's not a bat channel. It's a God channel. Anyway, we love you. Be blessed. <laughs>